Welcome to Forgotten TV, the podcast that brings you TV memories of the 70s and 80s with a focus on short-lived TV shows, TV pilots, and made-for-TV movies. I'm Chris Cooling. Last time on Forgotten TV. This time on Forgotten TV, we continue our look at the 1970s TV incarnations of live-action superheroes. It's the Super 70s, Part 4. Our next stop, Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, created by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, first appeared in Strange Tales in 1963. Doctor Strange serves as the Sorcerer Supreme, the primary protector of Earth against magical and mystical threats. Yes, Doctor Strange was created during the Silver Age of Comics to bring a different kind of character and themes of mysticism to Marvel Comics. Doctor Strange was a brilliant, egotistical surgeon. After a car accident severely damages his hands and hinders his ability to perform surgery, he searches the globe for a way to repair them and encounters an ancient sorcerer, the Ancient One. After becoming one of the old Sorcerer Supreme's students, he becomes a practitioner of both the mystical arts as well as martial arts. He obtains a costume embedded with mystical objects which give him added powers. Strange is aided along the way by his friend and valet, Wong, originally a stereotypical Asian manservant and a large assortment of mystical objects. He takes up residence in a mansion called the Sanctum Sanctorum, located in New York City. Later, Strange himself takes the title of Sorcerer Supreme. The character gained popularity primarily with the college crowd in the countercultural 1960s. In the late 1970s, when CBS obtained the rights to several Marvel characters and was already airing Spider-Man as well as The Incredible Hulk, writer, director, and producer Philip DeGere, who had previously worked on The Bionic Woman and Black Sheep Squadron, was tasked with manifesting Doctor Strange in his first television appearance. According to sources I've read, this production is the one that had the most input from Stan Lee. TV and film actor Peter Hooten was cast as the title character Doctor Strange. Prolific TV actress Jessica Walter was the evil Morgan Le Fay. Modern audiences probably recognize her the most from her voiceover work on Archer, as well as being Michael Bluth's drunken mother on Arrested Development. Established English actor Sir John Mills lends credibility to the film in his role as Lindmer, this film's version of The Ancient One. As the film opens, the audience is taken to an astral realm that is beyond space, and a title card appears. There is a barrier that separates the known from the unknown. Beyond this threshold lies a battleground where forces of good and evil are in eternal conflict. The fate of mankind hangs in the balance and awaits the outcome. In every age and time, some of us are called upon to join the battle. The movie opens with Morgan Le Fay talking to an evil disembodied head with lots of vocal fry. Morgan. Master. Raise your head and look up on me. Would it please you to be of service to me again? It would please me. Five hundred years ago, you failed me, Morgan. You allowed the greatest of the sorcerers on earth to overcome you. My victory was denied to me because of you. Long ages have I contemplated my revenge. This time I will not fail. Then I will send you into the world you have been exiled from. Find your enemy under the ancient symbol of light. The time now comes when he must pass on the powers entrusted to him. He grows old and weary of the burdens of his life on earth. Destroy the old man before the powers are past, and victory will be ours. You have three days to accomplish this. If you cannot defeat the old man, then strike against the successor. Who is to be the successor? Look for the ring at the ancient symbol. The one who wears the ring is the one who is chosen. You will not fail in this, Morgan. 
Morgan, or my punishment will be swift and terrible. You have three days to bring me my victory, and only three. So may it be. We then cut to New York City and the Sanctum Sanctorum, where the old sorcerer is about to give us even more exposition. Her name is Morgan Le Fay. Study her face and remember it. What does it say? One day you must take up Ladinwan, the Enchantress, Queen of the Sorcerers, the Dark Queen. And she hasn't aged. Working evil has a few advantages. The barriers are crumbling. Morgan is to be the first of the Dark Ones to cross the threshold. Her purpose is to destroy me. Then let her take my life then, if she can. No, you cannot interfere. Not yet. It's an ancient art to use an enemy's strength against him. We have three days to prepare the initiation. Find Stephen Strange. Stephen Strange is a psychiatrist at Modern East Side Hospital. The dialogue suggests he is evidently something of a self-absorbed ladies' man, but also a competent, caring doctor. LaFay appears in modern New York City and mind controls a random college student, Clea Lake, into pushing the old sorcerer off a bridge. He survives, but Clea will continue to have after-effects from the psychic assault she experienced. Wandering into the street after dreaming about what she did while under LaFay's control, she is brought to the hospital where Dr. Strange is called to examine her. He is soon paid a visit by Lindmer who is using Jedi mind tricks all over the hospital. Who are you? I'm sorry. I neglected to introduce myself. Do you believe in evil, Doctor? No. I believe in the human potentiality to do good, to do evil. Evil, per se. No, I don't believe in that. Unfortunate. It won't make our work any easier. What are you trying to say to me? We can help this girl clear lake. She's in grave danger. And I can promise you, the illness is beyond your capacity to cure by conventional means. I can't force you to do this, but if you choose it of your own free will, then come to my house. But I must warn you, there's danger in it for you as well. Is that all? Well, I think that's enough for now. Good day. Clea's condition worsens, and Doctor Strange decides to go talk to Obi-Wan. I mean, Merlin. I mean, Lindmer. My father gave me this ring, or actually left it to me in his will. The design on it is the same as your attic window. I also saw it on your calling card. So it is. Well, what's going on here? More than meets the eye. I was acquainted with your father. He and I shared some of the same interests. He was a greater man than most people realized, and his death was tragic and untimely. What interest did you and my father have in common? Yours. You're a very unusual man. Your father and I both recognized it when you were born. You've been gifted with a clear mind and a love for humanity, hence your choice to become a doctor. Also, some latent talents, which even you are not aware of yet. Such as what? We were speaking of evil this afternoon. The girl Clea has been touched by evil, used as a pawn, then discarded. But she was only an instrument. I was the intended target. If you understand what's happened to her, why can't you help her? Because the powers at my command are waning. I have nearly served my time. And to rescue Clea would expose me to an enemy who would certainly destroy me. But I can work through you to save her. What are these powers at your command? The hermetic arts. The ability to take the fundamental forces of the universe and direct them, control them with the will. Alchemy, sorcery, magic, or science. It's been called by many names. I don't think I'm ready for this. I think you are. You're telling me you're a sorcerer. And my father 
Was he like you? No. But he gave me the ring. And one day he knew you'd come for me, didn't he? After Doctor Strange agrees, Linmer sends him on a trip to retrieve Clea from the astral plane, where Strange immediately finds her, as well as quickly dispatches an evil being. But it turns out Morgan has been pulling her punches when it comes to Doctor Strange, and she has some explaining to do to the Nameless One. How have I toyed with you? I don't understand. This mortal, Stephen Strange, is the one chosen by Linda to succeed him. Thrice you had the opportunity to slay him, and thrice you stayed your hand. Why, Morgan? I commanded Belzeroth to bring him to me. It was he who failed. Do not lie to me, woman. Why have you spared him? I am still a woman. And the man attracted me. Then you find no satisfaction in my service. I would feel the warmth of a man's arms again. After all these years alone. So, Strange has saved Clea, but it still seems like he is not quite a believer. I don't know what you did to me last night. I don't want to know. It doesn't matter. I don't want anything more to do with it. As you wish. The choice is yours. Evil isn't a real thing. It's a condition of the mind, dysfunctional, destructive and, and curable. You call me a rational man, I am. I want to stay that way. I'm sorry I can't accept it. The choice is yours. Strange then unknowingly lets LeFay in the house while in the form of a cat, dispatches Wong, and we get plenty of evil synthesizer music while she walks around the house. She defeats Lindemer and takes him to the astral realm. LeFay interrupts Strange's date with Clea and still wants to get busy in spite of her prior chiding from the Nameless One. Morgan fails in trying to seduce Strange and is seemingly turned into Clark from Masters of the Universe. Lindmer explains he allowed Morgan to capture him and counted on Stephen to resist Morgan. In a ceremony, Lindmer transfers his powers to Stephen and a new costume magically appears. Stephen Strange, you are the one who is chosen. Do you accept the guardianship of the light? I do accept it. Then let the transmutation begin. It is done. I felt tremendous pain. Energies beyond your comprehension were circuited into your body. The circuit held. Have I become the sorcerer? You will be, when the Ancient One has taught you how to use your powers. You're like a child with a loaded gun. Unless you're careful, you can harm yourself or others. You have inherited the powers, but not the knowledge or the wisdom that must accompany them. Yet. What have I become? more than a man. As we wrap up the film, we inexplicably see Morgan on TV in a store window, being interviewed about her new self-help method, letting us know the forces of good have won the battle, but the war is far from over. She will be back, if this show gets picked up as a series. Looking back, this film borrows a lot of elements from Star Wars, which was released the prior summer, as well as horror movies of the late 70s. It is a little cheesy, but not nearly as terrible as many reviews state. It does seem to be popular to criticize actor Peter Hooten's flat performance. He did seem to have the same expression in every scene. The nameless one creature looks like something from the Star Trek episode Spectre of the Gun with the alien Melkotian that was uh, an elongated head. People criticize the motivation behind the Morgan Le Fay character. If I had to say something negative about the film, it would be that it does take itself too seriously. And it could have been softened a bit by the injection of a little bit of humor. The final TV version of his costume that he ended up in looked far better in the original concept art for the movie. One thing I thought was funny was when he was in his office, he picked up several magazines and one of them was a current era Hulk comic book. One thing I thought was great was the electronic music by uh, Paul Chihara, who went on to compose music for WizKids and China Beach, in addition to dozens of TV movies.
Great stuff. We also got some great uncredited voiceover performances by Michael and Sara, Ted Cassidy, and David Hooks. This TV movie aired at 8, 7 Central against 8 is Enough and a repeat of Roots Part 2. Now, this was the pre-VCR 70s. I mean, yes, a year earlier, VHS VCRs were released to the public, but only the most well-heeled early adopter would have had a video recorder when this actually aired. And a lot of people chose to tune in to Roots Part 2. And you can see what they mean by the concern about being the superhero network. Uh, on Tuesday night, they had Spider-Man. Wednesday night, The Incredible Hulk. Friday, they were airing Wonder Woman. So there was definitely a concern with having a superhero on the air nearly every night, which something is not much of a concern now if you see the current TV schedule. This film was pretty much forgotten about for 15 years, but was released on VHS in 1993, and video captures of this were easily findable on YouTube for quite some time. But as public interest was generated in last year's Marvel Studios' major motion picture release of Doctor Strange, Shout Factory obtained the rights to the 1978 TV movie last year and evidently had all those videos scrubbed from YouTube. Fortunately, they released a great-looking DVD, the video quality of which is pretty much the best you could possibly hope for from a 70s TV movie. This week, Gary Berghoff guest stars on Wonder Woman. Next stop, Times Square, where David Banner, man on the run, stops to defend a few small businessmen from the mob, only to find out it provokes another uncontrollable transformation to the Incredible Hulk. Then CBS On the Air comes in for a close-up look at the many incredible moments that made Friday a most unforgettable night. CBS On the Air, after Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk, starting Friday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain. Wonder Woman and the Dukes of Hazard will not be seen tonight, so that we may bring you this special CBS presentation. In 1976, Universal Television evidently picked up the rights to 12 Marvel characters from Marvel Comics for just over $1,000 each. Evidently, a Submariner TV movie was in the works, but was never made. Having now brought Captain Marvel, Spider-Man, The Hulk, and Doctor Strange to television, as well as picked up the final seasons of Wonder Woman, the final hero to make it to 1970s television was Captain America. Captain America was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby and first appeared in Captain America Comics No. 1, published in March 1941. Captain America was designed as a patriotic super soldier who often fought the Axis powers of World War II and was one of the most popular characters during this era. The popularity of superheroes waned following the war, and Captain America the comic book was discontinued in 1950, with a short-lived revival in 1953. Since Marvel Comics revived the character again in 1964, Captain America has remained in publication ever since. Captain America wears a costume that bears an American flag motif and is armed with a nearly indestructible shield that he throws. Originally, Steve Rogers, a frail young man enhanced to the peak of human perfection by an experimental serum to aid the United States government's efforts in World War II, he is often associated with the Avengers as well as the agency S.H.I.E.L.D. His first TV appearance was in the 1966 syndicated cartoon The Marvel Superheroes by Grantray Lawrence Animation and had this theme song. When Captain America throws his mighty shield, all those who chose to oppose his shield must yield. If he's led to a fight and a duel is due, then the red and the white and the blue will come through when Captain America throws his mighty shield. With a story by Don Ingalls, writer of two episodes of Star Trek, as well as Police Story, Fantasy Island, and several TV westerns, and an early directorial effort by prolific TV director Rod Holcomb, CBS and Universal Television brought a live-action version of Captain America to 1979 TV audiences. Titled Captain America, the film starred Reb Brown as Steve Rogers' Captain America, Lynn Berman as Simon Mills, and we also had an appearance by a perpetual bad guy, Lance LeGault. Instead of a World War II setting, we get a lengthy opening sequence of a mellow custom van driving up the California coast. Hey, Steve-O. How you doing, buddy? Real good, man. Real good. Yeah, where you been? 
I figured you got out of the Marines two weeks ago. Well, I've been coming down the coast slow and easy, you know, kicking back. Pretty mellow set of wheels. Yeah. It's going to be my home on the road for the next few years. All right. While Steve is driving up the coast slow and easy, a couple people are trying to get in touch. One is Simon Mills from National Security Laboratories. The other is an old friend, Jeff Hayden, with a vague request for help and that Steve come to his house that night to explain. On his way first to see Simon, some bad guys create a detour and an oil spill, sending his sweet custom van off the cliff. The van is wrecked, seemingly beyond repair, and Steve continues on his way to see Simon Mills on his dirt bike. Steve, I'm Simon Mills. Uh, I'm afraid I don't place you. Well, I'm not surprised we've never met, though I feel I've known you ever since you were a kid. Your father was my doctoral advisor. I assisted him in most of his experiments. Simon explained Steve's father's research developed a formula they called FLAG for full latent ability gain, a super steroid. It turns out Steve's father was more than just a researcher. Well, with your father, Steve, FLAG was a great deal more than just a lab experiment. What do you mean? I mean... He injected himself with the serum, and it worked. It worked, Steve. Do you understand what that means? Because it worked, he could accomplish things no other man could hope to. And so, he dedicated his life to helping the little guy in our society, to righting wrongs that the law wouldn't or couldn't touch. You mean he was a super crime fighter? In one sense, I suppose you could call him that, yes. And now you want me to take his place? No one else can. Steve is tired of serving his country and is not hot on the idea of helping in this capacity. He goes to his old friend's house and finds him dying. It turns out criminals were after some film Hayden had that had top secret information that would allow them to complete a neutron bomb, a nuclear device that minimizes physical destruction while maximizing the death toll from deadly neutron radiation. The bad guys stage another accident for Steve, this time injuring him severely in another trip off the cliff on one of those dangerous California coastal highways. There's just one chance. In a scene reminiscent of the $6 million man, Simon administers the flag serum to save Steve's life. Even though flag saved his life, Steve still isn't down with anything Simon has to offer. As soon as you're well enough, we'll start testing. No, Simon. We won't. What do you mean? We will not test. We're not going to find out what Flag may have done to me, because I don't want to know. Steve, you owe it to science to continue... To continue something I didn't start? Something that may kill me in a week, a month, a year? To continue something your own father started, and that so far has saved your life, not taken it. I'm grateful for that. But I'm not grateful for the fact that for the rest of my life, I'll never really know how long I have. Hey, hey, it's okay. I understand. But it's over. I'm not unconscious now. The choice is mine. I don't choose to play. Almost immediately, he is taken prisoner by the criminals. Now enhanced by flag, Steve makes short work of them and goes back to his beachside sketches. But Simon doesn't give up so easily. Steve, I'm authorized to offer you a job. Very much like mine, only using your very special talents. You don't mean Peyton, do you? You know what I mean. Sure. Full aid and ability game. That's a big part of it. Only four people would know. You, me, Wendy, and the president. Does he really know about me? And you're going to make me look bad if you refuse. I've even gone so far as to have some very special equipment designed with you in mind. I'll think about it. Anything you say. For your scrap. <sighs> Sensational. Can I keep it? It's all yours. Steve, think about what I said, huh? And, uh, stay in touch. Okay. Steve has given Simon a sketch of a patriotic looking hero in a costume. Soon, Simon gives Steve a look at some of that equipment he was talking about. How'd you get a hold of that? We borrowed it from the people you had repairing it. We finished the job and added a few little touches of our own. Those are the touches you wanted me to see? Mm Mm-hmm. Doesn't look that much different. 
The difference wasn't designed to be noticeable. Hey, this thing scramble eggs on Sunday, too? And it whistles Dixie. How do you get it out of here? Rocket assist for launch out of the van. And jet assist for high-speed acceleration. There's a switch under here. Keeps it standard. You flip it back and it's whisper silent. Now look. The material and our aerodynamic design of the shield is really interesting. It's bulletproof. And a rather deadly weapon. Why don't you try it out? See what it can do. for nearly three minutes to the Captain America theme by Mike Post and Pete Carpenter. The bad guys show up in a helicopter and start shooting at Steve, but he manages to leap onto the helicopter from the motorcycle and end the assault. Remember that film the bad guys were after? It's finally found, and the bad guys complete the neutron bomb. Steve finally decides to go after them, where they're hiding at an oil refinery. Simon has one more thing for him. You're going to need something to protect you on that bike anyway. Why not make it a disguise? Something that'll make it impossible for them to remember or even recognize you at all. You gotta be kidding. This is my drawing. Why not? It's perfect. They ridiculed your father, remember? Called him Captain America and finally murdered him. Be Captain America, Steve. Jam Captain America down their throats and at the same time protect yourself. Steve gets to the oil refinery and finds out the bomb is already gone, having left on a truck. There's nothing you can do. It's too late. Too late for what? It's too late to stop him. They pulled out four hours ago. What's he going to do? Tell me. He's got the bomb. The neutron bomb. What's he going to do with it? At noon. They're all going to die. It turns out the bad guys are going to use the neutron bomb to steal gold from a gold depository or something. Steve chases the truck on the motorcycle, is able to hop onto the truck and stop them. That means we're all going to make it, right? Right. (sighs) Sounds like the cowboy's about ready to arrive. Cops, MPs, and a bomb squad from the Atomic Energy Commission. Why don't you wait for me in the chopper? I'll turn this over to them and we can get out of here. You're the doctor. When you stop saying that. Steve decides he wants to look like his father when he shows up as Captain America, and we are given a typical action show stock ending. Yes, it is. Captain America did a pretty good job. Yeah. He did jam himself down a few throats, didn't he? (laughs) What do you say, Steve? Do we put Captain America on a permanent basis? Yes, But there's still one thing bothering me, Simon. If I'm going to be Captain America, I want to be the same Captain America my father was in every way. I don't just want to do the things he did. I want to look the way he did as well. Magnificent. 
the Incredible Hulk meets Captain America, each a foot tall with flyaway action pack. Assembly required. Just look up the flyaway pack, and here comes Captain A. Alex! This is a job for the Hulk. The Incredible Hulk with a face that's mean, lots of muscle and skin that's green. You can make them fly! Captain America and the Incredible Hulk, both with flyaway action pack, each sold separately by Mego. This whole movie is extremely padded. It's as if they didn't have enough pages of script to fill the 97-minute runtime. I'm serious. It's as if they had a typical 49-minute script and had to pad it out to fill two hours. The pacing and plot play out like any number of generic action-adventure TV shows of the time. Much can be and has been said about the acting talents of Reb Brown, which has now reached legendary B-movie status, and MST3K fans may know him by a few other names. Slab Bulkhead. Fridge Large Meats. Punt Speed Chunk. Butch Deadlift. Bold Big Flank. Splint Chest Hair. Flint Iron Stag. Bolt Vander Huge. Thick McRunfat. Blast Hard Cheese. Big McLarge Huge. Yes, he filled out the suit well, but his performance was so soft-spoken and low-key, he was even hard to hear in some scenes. But it's hard to hate on Reb. He brings a sort of affectionate, goofy quality to the role. I, I hope to run into him at a convention one of these days. Fortunately, we also had a decent theme from Mike Post and Pete Carpenter. This aired January 19, 1979, against a repeat of Donnie and Marie on ABC and Different Strokes followed by The Rockford Files on NBC. It got even better ratings than the Spider-Man and Incredible Hulk pilot movies, a 20.8 rating with a 33 share. CBS authorized a second TV movie backdoor pilot as they had done with The Incredible Hulk. The second TV movie, they split up into two one-hour segments, both airing at 7 p.m. Central on Friday and Saturday, November 23rd and 24th of 1979. Now, instead of an extensive clipped run-through of this entire plot, here's the trailer advertising the VHS release. In Captain America 2, the U.S. government calls on Steve Rogers to help uncover a sinister plot against the United States by one of the world's deadliest criminals. Miguel? The revolutionary? In his quest for world domination, this man plans on holding the United States hostage. Yeah. In two days, we'll have enough of those aging compound to affect that entire city. He's demanding one billion dollars immediately. Or he'll spread a chemical through a major American city, a chemical that will cause rapid aging. This is a job for Captain America. Reb Brown, Christopher Lee, Connie Selica and Len Berman star in this high-flying action-adventure tale as America's greatest hero battles against overwhelming odds in Captain America 2, Death Too Soon. Both Reb Brown and Lynn Berman reprise their roles, and Christopher Lee, as well as Connie Selica, are added to the cast. We also get an appearance by longtime character actress Susan French as an old woman that Steve helps at the beginning. It's always a treat to see her. The film opens with the exact same lengthy driving sequence as the first film, complete with the dirt bike that was destroyed in the first movie on the back of his van. The plot revolved around a terrorist, Miguel, that holds America hostage by threatening to dump a chemical over the city of Portland that will age the population at a rate of 38 days per hour, and he wants $2 billion for the antidote. The production quality was a little bit better than the first outing. There were a couple of decent stunts, one of which was shot at Folsom Dam in Folsom, California, and another where his motorcycle deploys a hang glider, which was a pretty cool scene. But it was really more of the same, and both Christopher Lee and Connie Selica were completely wasted in their roles. Reb Brown's acting was improved over the first installment, and he was much easier to understand. This second outing for Cap didn't fare nearly so well in the ratings, part one getting a 16.1 rating with a 27 share, and the second part performing just under that. 
When CBS re-aired this film the following summer, it got even more dismal ratings, and CBS never ordered a series of either Doctor Strange or Captain America. One could argue CBS never intended to order a Doctor Strange series, slotting it against Roots, as well as never bothering to re-air it. It's possible the production left a bad taste in their mouth, with the production running five days over schedule and being significantly over budget. Captain America, however, could have been a fun action series, a welcome addition to Friday or Saturday Night Escapism. Perhaps they felt it was just too similar to ABC's The Six Million Dollar Man, which had just ended its five-year run, or it was another casualty of CBS not wanting to be the superhero network. Just like 1978's Doctor Strange, these Captain America TV movies are no longer findable on YouTube in their entirety, but were released in 2011 on a DVD by Shout Factory. While the Doctor Strange DVD looked great, the same cannot be said for this DVD, which looks like they used the same video masters as the previous VHS releases. And the audio was just as bad. The crackle you heard on the sound clips was on the DVD. Well, that brings to a close our look at the Super 70s, a podcast series that I had a lot of fun producing. At some point, we will have to do a series on the Super 80s. But for now, check out what's in store this year for Forgotten TV. Coming this year on Forgotten TV. Sam Jones is the highwayman. And I want you. Jacko is Jemmo. Together. We're assault. It's battery! Two guys out to energize your Friday. Watch us! Heading your way next Friday. The highwayman. You shall all die. Trapped on a strange landmass, they come from different times, but they're all in danger now. Use whatever means necessary. An unearthly swamp and an android colony with a human leader await on the fantastic journey. Roddy McDowell joins the fantastic journey Thursday at 8, 7 Central and Mountain Time on NBC. Hunters found them in the wilds of northern Minnesota. A boy raised from infancy by wolves. They captured him and brought him to the university where I was conducting research on human behavior. I named him Lucan. Beans Baxter may look like your typical teenager, but this kid has one of the most dangerous after-school jobs going. I should know. I'm Baxter's boss. The government calls me number two. You see, Beans Baxter is a spy. Not even his mother or little brother knows he's working on the side. If they did, it could endanger their lives. Now it's up to Beans and the network to find his father and destroy UGLI's plans for world domination. And if you think it can't be done, then you don't know Beans. Cliffhangers. Three continuing action-packed stories in one show. First, The Secret Empire. Next... A beautiful newspaper reporter travels the globe to uncover a plot which will end the world. But when this ring of master spies finds she's hot on their trail, all they want to do is stop Susan Williams. Then it's Dracula 79. Watch Tuesday on NBC. They don't call them cliffhangers for nothing. He ain't got no walking stick. He don't need no ball and chain. He ain't got no hand to kick That don't mean nothing to James Oh, James singing Oh, James The people in the street Oh, the pouring of the brain Is it a feeling in the heart Or is it something you can't name Oh, James singing Oh, James the people in James at 15, the best new series on television James at 15 Well, what do you think? Maybe you ought to lie down again. Sam J. Jones stars as The Spirit, Friday night on ABC.
Forgotten TV is not affiliated with Marvel Entertainment, CBS, Shout Factory, or Universal Studios. Doctor Strange, Captain America, and related characters are the property and trademarks of the Disney Company and Marvel Entertainment, and no infringement is intended. Audio clips are included for the purposes of review, commentary, and criticism only, and are not intended to infringe. And I'd like to thank the following YouTube channels for making this episode possible. Sean MC, OCP Communications, ASMR Mark, The Avengers Captain. If you like Forgotten TV, you might enjoy Walnut Grovecast, where we discuss episodes of Little House on the Prairie. Forgotten TV is now a member of the Frequent Wire Podcast Network. To find other great podcasts, click the link to Frequent Wire in the show notes. Subscribe to Forgotten TV on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. To interact with me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or to easily support the show by doing your regular shopping on Amazon, that's all linked up for you at Forgotten.tv. Until next time, I'm Chris Cooling, and this has been Forgotten TV. Forgotten TV.